Hallelujah. Well, as we were singing that song about the goodness of God, I couldn't help but think about the fact that my brother and I are here together at God's altar. From the life we lived as kids, which was very difficult, for the time we were separated for 13 years, and he came to Christ, and I was on my way to hell in, in a very disappointing and bad way. But we, God brought us back together, and he gave me a Bible, and I got saved. <laughs> and when I think about the fact that he's coming to preach here at a church that I pastor, let me tell you something. If you don't believe in miracles, if you saw us then, you would now. My brother is, <laughs> he's a theologian. <laughs> he has a master's in physics. He was a scientist who went to prove the Bible wrong and ended up becoming a Christian. He, got his doctorate, a THM and a PhD and all these things that if you want to know what that means, just Google it. But I could tell you this, he knows the word inside out. Many of you watch him on his YouTube channel. I encourage you to download that. When he comes up here, you'll, you'll see how much we look alike. We're like twins. But... He is my brother from another father. Dr. David Dean is going to come up and give the word here today. Thank you all. Sit down, relax. You probably saw that in profile we look the same. Otherwise... <laughs> You know, it's, it, it's the schnoz. Well, shalom to you all. I'm really grateful to be here with you. My wife and I are grateful for your prayers and the way you support us and help us in our ministry in Hong Kong. This morning, I want to talk to you about a very simple word, the little word in spelled I-N. We use this word all the time without even thinking about it. By itself, that word has no significance, but when it's combined with other words in the Bible, its significance is enormous, and sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. Understanding how the Bible uses the little word in is crucial to understanding why faith is the one and only condition of eternal life. Have you ever wondered why God cares so much about what we believe? Today I hope to answer that question. The title for my message is The Little Word In or Why Faith Matters. My goal today is to clarify what faith is and to show why God will bestow his gift of eternal life only on those who believe the good news of Jesus Christ. I want to begin our study of the importance of faith by exploring the significance of the little word in, in two particular verses of scripture. One I'm sure most of you know very well, John 3.16. The other is John 5.24. Both of these texts record the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both of these texts describe the conditions of salvation. Both of these texts declare what a person must do to receive God's eternal forgiveness. And so I'm going to read these verses to you from the New King James, which is the translation that I usually use. We'll start with John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Did you catch how Jesus describes the condition of salvation in this verse? He says that God will give eternal life to whoever believes in him. That is, whoever believes in Jesus. Well, now listen to John 5.24, also from the New King James Version. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not be condemned, but has, crossed, but has passed from death into life. Now, in this verse, Jesus describes the conditions of salvation as, listen, believing in God the Father who sent Jesus. And so on the surface, it appears that John 3.16 and John 5.24 don't agree. One says that we must believe in Jesus, and one says that we must believe in God the Father. Well, before we address that seeming contradiction, let's consider again the similarities between these two verses. Both are made by Jesus. Both express the fact that the default destination of all people is eternal condemnation. Behind that fact is a truth that we see and read about over and over again in Scripture. The Bible says that we humans are all sinners. We're born sinners. We sin because it's our nature to sin. We are morally defective. We all start life on what Jesus calls the broad road that leads to destruction. In John 3.16, Jesus refers to the default destination with those words, should not perish. In John 5.24, he refers to the default destination with the words, shall not come into judgment. In both cases, he affirms the fact that unless God intervenes, each and every one of us will end up in hell. There's only one way for the individual to escape from the default destination. We must receive something that God alone can provide. The Bible describes that something using a number of different terms. Eternal forgiveness, salvation from sin, the gift of eternal life, regeneration. But God gives that gift only to those who meet certain conditions. The way that Jesus describes the conditions of salvation in John 5, 24 sounds very similar to what he says in John 3, 16, except that in John 3, 16, he says that we must believe in him. And in John 5, 24, he says that we must believe in the Father. It does appear on the surface that we have a contradiction. But we know that Jesus would never contradict himself. And we know that Scripture the written word of God is internally consistent. The solution to this apparent contradiction involves the little word in both as it is used in scripture and as we use it in modern English. So I want to take a closer look at this concept of believing in and see whether we can solve this puzzle. Is there a way to reconcile John 3.16 and John 5.24? I believe that there is. The first step in solving our puzzle is recognizing that there's a difference in modern English between believing in and believing. Let me illustrate this for you. Let's start with believing in. If I ask a small child this question, do you believe in Santa Claus? The child will probably answer yes. And when he does so, what he means is that he believes that Santa Claus is a real person who actually exists. Or suppose I were to go out and do a poll on the street and ask people this question. Do you believe in man-made climate change? Some would say yes. Others would say no. When we ask the question, do you believe in such and such, that question really means do you believe that such and such exists? But now let's consider believing. 
Let me give you a contemporary example. The presidential election is coming. Every day in the news we hear polling information. One poll says that the Democrats are ahead. Another poll says that the Republicans are ahead. If I were to ask you, do you believe the polls? Many of you would say, not really. But that doesn't mean that you deny the existence of polls or the people who make the polls. Believing a poll has to do with accepting or rejecting the truth claims of the pollsters. Now, personally, I believe in the Gallup poll, but I don't believe the Gallup poll. <laughs> in the ways in which we use the terms in modern English, there's a big difference between believing in and believing. Well, let's move on now to more serious matters. Suppose I were to ask someone on the street, do you believe in God? Or suppose someone had asked me that question. For the first two decades of my life, if you'd asked me that question, I would have emphatically answered no. At that time, I was an atheist. An atheist is a person who denies the existence of God. When an atheist says, I do not believe in God, he is declaring his conviction that no such thing as God exists. On the other hand, a theist is a person who does believe in the existence of God. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a theist. Now, but having said that, it's vital that we be clear that simply believing in God, in other words, believing that some kind of God exists, being a theist is not enough for anyone to be saved. The world is full of theists who have never met the necessary condition to receive God's gift of eternal life. For example, Muslims believe in the existence of an eternal God, they even claim to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Old Testament. Yet scripture clearly states that anyone who claims to believe in the God of the Bible, but who rejects Jesus Christ as the one and only divine savior remains unsaved. Speaking on the subject of believing in God, James says this in chapter two of his book. You believe that there is one God? You do well. But even the demons believe and they tremble. The demons believe in God. They believe in his existence, but they are not eternally saved. It's clearly clear that simply believing in the existence of God falls far short of the true condition of salvation. Now, the second step in solving our puzzle has to do with what the Bible means when it speaks of believing in Jesus and believing in God the Father. Now, I want to show you what I mean, and to do so, I want to compare the translation of John 5.24 in the New King James, which I normally use, and in the NIV. As I read these two verses and compare them, I want you to be listening for the little word in. First, the New King James. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And now the 1984 version of the NIV. Listen carefully. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Did you notice the difference? The new King James says, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me, while the NIV says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me. What's the difference? It's that little word in the little word in is present in the New King James and absent in the NIV. I'm sorry, yes. Does that mean that one of these translations is correct and the other one is wrong? Well, not really. The language of the New King James Version is a little bit more old fashioned. The NIV is a little bit more clear in terms of how we speak in modern English, 
but they both reflect the same meaning in Greek because in the Bible, to believe in a person means much more than simply acknowledging the fact of that person's existence. It means trusting that person. It means relying on the faithfulness of that person. Above all, it means having complete confidence in the truthfulness of that person. So let's take some time now to examine John 5.24 in detail. And as we do, I think we will see that there is really no contradiction between John 3.16 and John 5.24. Listen as I read that verse to you one more time from the NIV. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. The necessary condition for eternal life that Jesus lays out here certainly involves what a person believes. But more importantly, it involves whom a person believes. I want to explore seven aspects of this verse with you. Let me list them for you. Number one, the certainty of the statement. Number two, the role of Jesus. Number three, the message from the Father. Number four, the condition of the promise. Number five, the possession of the believer. Number six, the security of the believer. And number seven, the arrival of the believer. Let's start by considering the certainty of the statement that Jesus makes in John 5, 24. It's really interesting to see how different translations render the very first part of that verse. The NIV has, I tell you the truth. The New King James has, most assuredly, I say to you. The NET has, I tell you the solemn truth. The Greek literally says, Truly, truly, I say to you. In this phrase, Jesus is expressing in the most emphatic way possible that what he's about to declare in the remainder of this verse is absolutely and undeniably true. He's really saying, listen up. This is important. Well, second, let's consider the role of Jesus. Jesus says, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's describing his role during his first coming ministry as the role of a prophet. A person who brings a message from God the Father. In John chapter 12 verses 49 and 50, Jesus explains his prophetic role in the clearest of terms. Listen. I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Jesus performed the role of a prophet. He brought a message from the Father. And this fact really resolves the seeming contradiction between John 3.16 and John 5.24. Believing the Son is the same as believing the Father because the message that the Son brings is a message from the Father. That leads us to the third aspect of John 5.24. The message that Jesus delivered from the Father. The message of the Father includes everything that Jesus taught, and in fact, everything that is recorded in Scripture. In John 17, 17, Jesus offered the following prayer to the Father. He said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 say this, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. God spoke to mankind first through the Old Testament writers and prophets, 
and then through his son while he was here on earth. And the remainder of the New Testament after the Gospels is the writers of men whom God, through whom God explained the significance of what Jesus had done, what he's doing now, and what he will do in the future. So now we come to aspect number four, the condition of the promise. Jesus tells us that the promise of eternal life applies to whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me. Now notice the two verbs. One must hear. In other words, he must be exposed to the message that Jesus brought from the Father. But hearing alone is not enough. One must also believe. In other words, he must accept as true the message that Jesus brought from the Father. Here we see the importance of that little word in. In John 3.16, the call was to believe in Jesus. Without the clarification that comes from other passages of God's word, we might simply think that all you have to do is to believe in the existence of Jesus as a historical person, and that would be sufficient to receive God's salvation. But here in John 5.24, we can see clearly the true heart of the matter. The condition of eternal life is not merely believing in the existence of God or even in the reality of Jesus as a real historic person. No, the one and only condition of eternal life is believing God. I'm going to say that again. The one and only condition of eternal life is believing God. Listen to these words from John 336. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now, a more literal translation of that last phrase would go like this. He who disbelieves the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The Bible says that we all start life under the wrath of God. It says that God will give the gift of eternal life to any particular individual under only one condition. The individual must not only hear the Father's message, he must also believe the Father's message. He must accept what God says as true. That is the essence of saving faith. I want you to hold on to that idea because we're going to come back to it later. The fifth aspect of John 5.24 is the possession of the one who believes, namely eternal life. Jesus says that whoever hears and believes has eternal life. Eternal life is a present possession received immediately when the individual believes what God has declared. Now, God's gift of eternal life includes many things. Negatively, it starts with the promise that one will not perish. He will not be condemned to eternal hell when he dies. But positively, the promise of eternal life means that after physical death, the believer will be received into God's presence. And ultimately, it includes the guarantee of a new, immortal, glorious resurrection body. It includes the promise of individual rewards for the ways in which we have served God. It includes the promise that we will participate in Christ's earthly millennial kingdom, helping him to rule and reign. And it includes the promise of unending blessed life in the new heavens and earth, a new universe in which there will be no death, no sorrow, no pain, and no sin. If you have heard the Father's message through the Son, and if you have truly believed it, all of these things are promised to you, and because God is faithful to his promises, you will surely receive them at the proper time. 
Well, that leads us to the sixth aspect of John 5, 24, the security of the believer. Listen again to what Jesus says. He says, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has everlasting life and will not be condemned. I want you to notice the tenses of those verbs. The believer has everlasting life as soon as he believes what the Father has declared. It's a present possession that becomes his at the very moment when he meets the condition of believing. And then we have a future tense verb. The believer will not be condemned. That simply cannot happen. If you are truly saved today, it is impossible that you could become unsaved tomorrow. Salvation is not something that you achieve by your own efforts. It's not something that you can purchase with your labor or your obedience or your money. Salvation is a gift of God, and God never takes back what he has promised to give. Jesus declared this truth, the truth that theologians call eternal security again and again. I want you to listen to his words from John chapter 10, verses 28 to 29. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Paul made the same point in Romans chapter 8 regarding the believer when he wrote these words in verses 38 and 39. And by the way, the preceding verses speak of the persecution of Christians. He said, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. If you have heard, if you have heard and believed God's message, you are secure in your salvation. You will never be condemned. Why? Because God never breaks his promise. Never breaks his promise. Well, finally, we come to the seventh aspect of John 5, 24, the arrival of the believer. Jesus says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life I love this verse because here in John 5, 24, Jesus tells us that if you believe, you have been rescued from the tragedy of death as an unsaved person. And let's be clear about this. Those who go to death unsaved are a tragedy. They are a tragedy. If you have believed God's message, you have eternal life now. Think about that phrase, he has crossed over. Jesus referred again and again to this idea of crossing over. Think of John 14, 6, where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The Lord Jesus Christ is like a bridge that carries the believer from the status of condemned sinner to the status of beloved child of God. He's like a bridge that carries the believer from spiritual death to spiritual life. And if you have heard and believed the message that the Father sent through the Son, you have crossed over from death to life. You have eternal life now. You will not be condemned. And what that means is that although the fulfillment of many of God's promises to you await future days, there is a real sense in which you have already arrived. Now with that examination of John 5, 24 behind us, I want to read to you Paul's words from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. 
In these verses, Paul tells us exactly what God has declared that one must believe in order to receive the gift of eternal life. John chapter 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, when Paul says, unless you believed in vain, he's referring to something he'll say later in the chapter. He will say, some of you doubt the resurrection, but if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, your faith is worthless. And then he will go on to say, but Jesus did rise from the dead, and therefore your faith is not worthless. Now, let me continue. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, though some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James and by all the apostles. In order to be saved, one must believe what the Bible calls the good news or the gospel. The gospel is a particular message regarding Jesus that we have just read. Jesus himself accomplished the events that are recorded here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in the gospel message. It is his sacrifice on the cross in which he took upon himself the penalty for your sins and mine that makes our salvation possible. Well, I want to pull John 3.16 and John 5.24 together once more. Each of these verses lays out the conditions of salvation. In John 3.16, Jesus calls us to believe in him. But when he says that we must believe in him, he is referring to what Paul calls the gospel, the fact that Jesus gave his life on the cross so that we could be saved. But I'm wondering, did you notice something very interesting and somewhat unusual about John 5.24? In John 5.24, Jesus says nothing about the cross. He says nothing about the cross, and he doesn't really mention himself at all except the fact that he is the bearer of a message. He simply says that if we believe God... God will give us the gift of eternal life. Now, there's no contradiction between John 5, 24 and John 3, 16 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. However, in John 5, 24, Jesus reveals not only how we who live after the cross must be saved, but also how people who live before the cross were saved. Let's think this through. Could a person who lived before the cross be saved by believing the message about the death and resurrection of Jesus? No. You you can't believe something that hasn't taken place yet and hasn't been revealed. So how were people saved before the cross? Let's pursue the answer to this question by eliminating some of the possibilities. First, we know that no one could ever be saved by doing good deeds. All people are sinful. We all bear the guilt of the sins and the crimes that we have committed. And even if we do good things, the good things that we do cannot erase the guilt of the bad things that we have done. God's law simply does not allow such a cancellation, and neither does human law. Romans 3.20 says this, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, in other words, by doing what the law says is right, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law comes the knowledge of sin. The purpose of law is not to make us right when we are already wrong. The purpose of law is to expose our sin so that we know that we are guilty. Law cannot save us. Our good deeds cannot save us. Well, what about animal sacrifices? Think of all those bulls and goats and turtle doves 
other animals that were sacrificed in Old Testament times. Is it possible that before the cross, sacrifices were the means of salvation? No, that doesn't work either. Hebrews 10.4 says, It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Animal sacrifices never paid the debt of sin. They served the purpose of educating mankind in the concept that substitutionary atonement was possible, but the only substitution who could pay the price of the human debt of sin is a sinless human. And the only one who could do that is the sinless divine and human son of God. So it's clear that neither good deeds nor sacrifices were able to provide salvation before the cross. And yet we know that many people in Old Testament times, people like Abraham and Moses and David, were surely saved. They couldn't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus had not yet come. He had not gone to the cross. So how then were they saved? Well, Jesus is actually giving us the answer in John 5, 24. That takes us back to the difference between believing in God and believing God. People were saved before the cross by believing God. In other words, by believing whatever message God had already sent to them. Now, to see the proof of this truth, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast of, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Isn't it interesting that Paul, in explaining how we who live after the cross get saved, goes back to the example of someone who lived before the cross and was saved. That statement, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, is a quote from Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Now, you probably know the story. In Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham was 75 years old and his wife was a few years younger and they were way past childbearing years, God promised to give Abraham a son. In fact, he promised to make Abraham's descendants more numerous than the stars that Abraham could count in the sky. But then we come to Genesis chapter 15, and Abraham is now 86 years old, and he still doesn't have a son. And God appears to him, and Abraham complains. He says, you haven't given me a son. At that time, God reaffirms his promise that he will give Abraham a son. In fact, he takes him outside and says, look at the stars. Look how many there are. The Bible says that Abraham heard God's promise and he believed it. Abraham didn't know about the cross. What Abraham knew is what God had declared and he chose to believe it. He met the condition of John 5, 24. He heard and believed God's message. And in response, God gave him the gift of everlasting life. Now, do you see what's happening here? The condition of salvation that Jesus lays out in John 5, 24 is timeless. It applies to all of human history from the moment after Adam and Eve had fallen into sin all the way up to the future day that we call the day of the great white throne judgment. For Abraham, the message that he had to hear and believe was God's promise of a son. For others who lived before the cross, what they had to hear and believe was whatever God had already revealed in their time 
through the prophets and the scriptures. But for us who live after the cross, what we must believe is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the message that God the Father sent God the Son to die for our sins and to rise from the dead in order to be our Savior. John 5.24 explains salvation both before and after the cross, and that's why it's my favorite gospel verse. Whether one lived before the cross or after the cross, salvation has always been a gift of God that he gives to those who hear his message and believe him. The choice to believe God is what the Bible means by the word faith. Now, many people, including many Christians, have some wrong ideas about faith. Faith is not a substance. Faith is not a power of the mind. Faith itself has no ability to change reality. The truth about faith is that a person's faith only has value when the object of his faith is worthy of his trust. John's gospel, the one from which our two verses come, is the only gospel whose purpose is clearly stated by the author. And its purpose is related to believing. John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31. John says, And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The Holy Spirit led John to write this book for the express purpose of leading unbelievers to eternal life. Now, I'm going to give you a very brief Greek lesson. The Greek noun for faith is the word pistis. The Greek verb for believing is the word pistuo. Do you see how similar they sound? Pistis, pistuo. They sound the same because in the language of the Bible, Believing is an action. Faith is the condition of believing. And here's a surprising fact for you from John's gospel. You will never find the word faith in John's gospel. It's not there. John always uses the verb to believe. Now, that doesn't mean that faith isn't a condition of salvation, But John always uses the verb to believe because just as hearing is an action, believing is an action too. The only thing that one must do to be saved is to believe. Believe what? Believe what God has said here in the pages of his written word. Now perhaps you're wondering why God cares so much about what we believe. Why does what I believe determine where God will send me for all of eternity? I want you to stop for a moment to think about what happened in the fall. God had declared that if Adam or Eve ate the forbidden fruit, they would surely die. And sometime later, Satan enters the Garden of Eden in the form of a serpent And he makes a declaration. God is wrong. Eat the fruit. You will not surely die. When our first parents ate that fruit, they were declaring by their actions that they believed that Satan was telling the truth and that God was a liar. Death came to the human race when Adam and Eve chose to disbelieve God. Is it any surprise then that God gives the gift of eternal life to us on only one condition? Namely, the condition that we hear what he has declared and we believe 
him. The one and only condition of salvation is embracing the truth of what God declares in his written word. And when we talk about faith, we're not talking about mere intellectual assent. Biblical faith involves the intellect, the emotions, and the will. It involves your intellect. You need to believe it's true. It involves the emotions. You must want what God offers. And it involves the will. You must choose to rely upon him and nothing else. That's biblical faith. That's what it means to have faith in God. Faith in God is hearing God's message and believing him. Not believing in him in the way that we say it in modern English, but believing him. That is the point that Jesus makes in John 5, 24, and it's really the point that he makes in John 3, 16. Now, I want to conclude this message by making it personal. As I see it, everyone in this room falls into one of three groups. Group number one, those of you who are truly saved because you have believed what God says. Group number two, those of you who haven't believed what God says. And group number three, those of you who think that the God of the Bible will accept you on some other basis beside simply hearing and believing his word. Now, I'm not going to ask you which group you fall into, but I am going to address each of these groups, and one of them applies to every one of you. First, I want to address those of you who fall into group one. You have heard and have believed God's message. You believe the gospel. You accept this book as God's divine and authoritative and fully true word. You have reason to rejoice. Come what may, whether it be unemployment or illness or natural disaster, economic collapse, nuclear war, or what will come to all of us, physical death, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Your eternity is secure. This is good news. But remember, that doesn't mean that you should be lazy or let down your defenses against sin. It doesn't mean that the way you live your life doesn't matter. God expects you to strive to live up to your status as his beloved child. He doesn't expect sinless perfection, but he does expect effort. Well, now let me address those of you who fall into group two. You know that you have not believed the gospel. Now, perhaps today is the first time that you've heard it. Perhaps you've heard it before, but you just don't believe it. Perhaps you follow some other religion and you think that that religion can make you right with God or solve the problem of what's going to happen to you after you die. Perhaps you have accepted the theory of Darwinism and the whole modern materialistic scientific worldview that says that you are nothing but the result of a long series of biochemical accidents and when your body ceases to function, your soul and your spirit and your consciousness will just go out of existence and there's nothing to worry about after death. I could spend hours addressing the errors of those ideas, but instead I want to leave you with just one passage of scripture to think about for a few minutes. I want you to listen to the words of God from Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 and 10. He says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Allow me to paraphrase God's words in this text. I 
dare you. I dare you to find another book like my book, the Bible. This book in which I predicted numerous events centuries before they took place, and it's proven that those prophecies were accurate. My word has proven itself to be true. Therefore, whatever religion or scientific theory that may contradict my word is false. Give up your hopes and your false beliefs. They cannot save you and instead believe me. If you do, the gift of eternal life is yours. And if not, your sins will send you to eternal condemnation. My final words are for those of you who fall into group number three. You think that you believe in the God of the Bible, but you also think that God will accept you on some other basis besides simple faith in the gospel. Perhaps you think that your good deeds will earn you a place in heaven. Perhaps you think that loving God is enough. Or perhaps you think that because the Bible says that God is love, and it does say that, God, because he's a loving God, would never send anyone to hell. I have bad news for you. In John 3, 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world, but he also said that those who do not believe will perish. Churches everywhere are filled with self-deceived people who have placed the cart before the horse. The Bible never says that God will save people who love him. It never says that God will save people who serve him, nor does it say that God will save people who obey him. It never says, you shall love God and your love will set you free. It never says, you shall serve God and your service will set you free. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Now it's true, God does want our love and our service and our obedience. He does. But love and service and obedience can never earn us a place in God's family. Faith must come first. We must hear and believe what God has said. Only after we hear and believe will God save us and make us spiritually alive and join himself to his family. It's only after God saves us and changes us that we will be able to love him and serve him and obey him in ways that will please him. No one has ever been saved by merely believing in God. The one condition of salvation is believing God. And so I asked you this question. Do you believe God? Now I'd like to ask you all, if you would, to close your eyes and bow your heads and think for a moment, forget about the people sitting around you and face the fact that in a sense you are alone in this room with God. I want you to think and ask yourself this question, have I believed God? If the answer is yes, you have reason to rejoice. If the answer is no, I'm going to invite you to make the choice to believe God today. And if you're in the third group, if you have been attending Grace Church for a week or a month, or for years, and you have realized today that you have never truly believed God, I'm also going to invite you to do that very thing. So, pray after me if you are in that situation. Father, it isn't until today that I realized from your word that the only thing that could possibly make me right with you is believing you. You have said that I am like everyone else. 
that I was born a sinner. I didn't become a sinner by sinning. I sin because it's my nature to sin. I am defective. You created me to be a human who by his behavior could bring glory to you by living in ways that show your personal qualities. And yet I have fallen short many times. And in the same way that a disobedient child shames its parents, I have shamed you by misrepresenting your holy and just and good and kind and loving and merciful nature. I believe what you have said, Father. I deserve eternal condemnation and there's nothing I can do to pay my debt. I also believe that you sent your son, the incarnate Lord Jesus, who lived a sinless life, who died on a cross, paying the debt of my sins. I believe that he rose three days later and that was your proof that you had accepted his sacrifice. I believe that because of what he has done, that he has paid my debt and I place my trust, my faith fully in him. I am believing him and I accept your promise that because I believe you will make me your child. So do that right now, Father. Make me your child. I believe you. If you have prayed that prayer, if today is the day in which you came to believe God, I would ask you to raise your hand. Don't be afraid to raise it. No one in particular is watching, but it, does it really matter if anybody is watching? We're talking about your eternity. We're talking about you making a relationship with your creator, becoming the child of the God of the universe. If you would raise your hand, and in a little while, we'll call you to come to the front of the room. Don't be shy. We want to encourage you, we want to rejoice with you, we want to help you on your journey. Raise your hand, don't be afraid. Father, I pray again for those who today have believed you. Give them the courage, not only to express to us what they have done, but give them the courage to honor you and to praise you publicly by acknowledging that they have received your gift of eternal life. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen.